I was the Assistant Inspector General of Police in charge of operations. Okay, so tell us what, what, uh, how did they start it for you? Well, uh, we have to look at it first of all a couple of days before because our president was out overseas for I think six weeks where he does his normal annual holidays and do whatever he was doing and then was coming back from England. And uh, I was Assistant Inspector General of Police and then normally uh, I would go to the airport when the president is coming. But something very curious happened on that day because on the day I was ordered by the Inspector General of Police to say not to go to the airport, which was a bit strange. And I still don't have an explanation. I've, de I've said that in my book. I don't know whether I was. Because prior to that, there has been always been rumors, of course, wolf, 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 and the wolf never turn up. And this time, there was this rumor of a coup, of a coup, and then, and then nothing happened. And then uh, in the evening, uh, I went out with my car, and I met with one of the, he's actually living here in exile. I met one of the superintendents who was in charge of our criminal intelligence and then he told me what happened at the airport that when the president came, remember by this time the government army was commanded by the Nigerians called NATAC, National Nigerian Army Training Assistant Group. And the Nigerian colonel who was in charge, I can think Colonel Akoji, um, they kind of sacked the soldiers because they didn't trust them and then sacked them before the guard of honor. And then afterwards uh, the president came, they did the guard of honor and and then the president went home and then and normally I go to work very early so normally I'm in my office by seven or so at six o'clock half six I leave my house because I was living in Bacau which is the, the barracks and then I go to Banjul which is the capital which is an island and you have to cross a major bridge called Dentin Bridge and then you go to the capital so I went to work as normal in the morning but as I was going by this time we already had mobile phones they were bigger mobile phones I I had a phone call uh, from one of the station officers in Yundum, which was the station office near to the airport and near to the military barracks, who called me and told me, sir, there's something happening in the barracks. I had some shots and some soldiers and so on. I said, yeah. And then I went to, uh, to my office. And then after the Inspector General was there, he called me and told me that there is some kind of mutiny in the barracks and the soldiers kind of like are moving towards uh, the capital. Yundum is a bit far, uh, I can't remember how many miles now, maybe 10, 15 miles or 20 miles from the capital and they, they, they're moving. They've kind of seized some of these private vehicles and boarded them and then they're moving towards the capital. So. We, as soon as we heard there was some kind of rebellion or whatever mutiny in the in the barracks, we deployed the tactical support group, that is kind of like the armed police, to the break, to to stop the soldiers, you know, we tried to capture the key positions to in order to be able to stop them. Because we've done it before, where the soldiers mutinied, and then we captured the main stuff and we were able to, to deter them and stop them. That's what all you were reading in the book. And this time, I, I, so I, I decided, I was there with the instructor general, I said, no, 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 this is not safe for us, we cannot just stay in our offices and, and I have to go towards the ground. So what I did was I drove with my driver and my orderly, we went to the Denton Bridge where I found the tactical support group, the way they were deployed. Since I've got a military background and I used to be their commander before, they know me. So and I came immediately, took charge, changed their positions because the way they were deployed was tactically to change it. So we managed to, so the only army came there, we stopped them and I was there. So we were there now in a tense confrontation. But they had heavy weapons, they have RPG, rocket launcher, we only had Kalashnikov and so on. And we were there, we did keep them for a couple of hours. Um, they sent some emissary to me and I said, no, they are not crossing. You know, we're going to fight if they cross, you know. And I told my guys, you know, shoot to kill, we have to fight. And I explained to them that they don't know a coup d'etat, this will destroy our country, to explain what is happening. Did you know who was the head of, the, uh, of this conflict at that time? No, uh, b by that time there was no head yet. What happened was there were four lieutenants. There was Jame, who's the now president. There was another lieutenant called Singate, who's a mixed race. And there was another lieutenant called Sabali and another lieutenant called Hydera. Basically, some of these four lieutenants who were leading this troop. So, uh, leadership, who is the leader, has not emerged yet. They were working, you know, it was a mutiny which has turned into a coup d'etat. So, whilst we are holding them at the bridge, there were some other developments where. As I said, prior to that, there is normally a West African training cruise by the Americans. 
uh, and there was supposed to be an exercise and in fact one of the army officers came to my office with a Nigerian lieutenant colonel called Sally to tell me that look tomorrow there's an exercise uh, between the Americans and the army and, and, the, and the, our army and there will be some exercise around that Denton Bridge. So I as the Assistant Inspector General of Police for Operation I mentioned my police troops and told them that the army are doing some exercise around the bridge, some amphibious landing and so on. That will be on the 22nd? That will be on the 22nd. So this we were discussing on the 21st of July. And then what a terrible coincidence this meeting start where the American boat is there and then I understand because I met the ADC he's living in exile in England here when we came to exile I asked him what happened so he told me that the president came remember came from England the previous night and just woke up by in the morning he, chief of intelligence told him that there is a mutiny well it's under control and then he comes oh this is not safe your, your excellency we have to take you to the because the American ambassador was coming to meet the president the vice president who was the minister of defense and that vice president told him, oh, it's not safe your family. And then they just bundled him and put him in a car and he drove to the port. And then he was now in the, uh, Niger and the American boat. So you don't think the American are uh, complicit in what happened? At that time, I don't think so. I don't believe that. I know uh, that the American ambassador who was there was kind of not very happy because, as I told you, we had a vice president who was there for 10 years and then there was election and then the president decided to appoint the Minister of Finance, well, which is his prerogative to appoint the Minister of Finance to be vice president. But that Minister of Finance, there were allegations of corruption, but this has never been proven in a court. Um, and who also happens to be to, to have a second wife who is the niece of the president. So there was a perception, and 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 there were some issues where there was a perception of corruption. But we, I have to be very careful that the guy was never, this was never proven. So there is this rumor or perception that the American ambassador was not happy with that, and that's why, because uh, I think, and the timing in Washington, because remember. 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock in Gambia is like, what, n midnight in Washington or, t or it's five, they are five hours behind or 3 o'clock or 2 o'clock. But I suppose in the State Department they'll have a 24-hour system. So technically the American ambassador could have reversed the coup if he wanted. So that, it will be for academics to go and uh, to, to, to go and check. Okay. So whilst we were at the bridge, so we were there for a time because the army were not, if they were determined, they would have just rolled over us. But they were kind of a bit scared because I was really ready and I was ready to fight. And uh, unfortunately, whilst we were there, we had information that they've captured my previous barracks where I was, the paramilitary barracks where I used to be the commander. But that's where all our communication, police communications is all linked there. And there was a brave soldier who who, 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 who sent that thing. And then I had to make a, an order on the radio and say radio silent, because obviously whatever we're saying, they've captured the, our main base, they will be listening to what we're doing. So now this necessitated me for go back to headquarters. And there was another captain there. I said, look, hold it, but I need to go. There's a new development that I need to go to headquarters to find out what is happening, because this is, uh, this is becoming. And then when I left, and they managed to send emissaries to the man and told him, you know, uh, convince him, you know, uh, these are the senior people, blah, blah, and then he kind of acquiesced. Then I came back, before you enter the island of Banjul proper, there is what we call the Bond Road, and there was a radio station there. So I came back again from my office and set up an ambush there, and then this was here that I engaged them. I physically... Yeah, but I physically uh, fired my magazine, but all my men were scared. Nobody fired. But still the army did not return fire to, to fight with me. So I managed to escape again and go back to my headquarters. So this is so you that they were not that determined. They ran away. Jammer and orders ran away. Did they know who you are? Yes, 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 yes. They know who I am. That was why when they were in the breach, they know. They know that, I'm, you know. And... Anyway, so they continue to manage, the president has gone and they went to the state house and now they are there. Any coup d'etat that happens, as soon as the soldiers take power, they announce their government. They did not announce, this was on a Friday, they did not announce their government until Monday. Because what they were doing is now they were running around and being secretly advised by some of those Nigerian army officers what to do. Telling them, no, first of all, you bring the religious leaders, you talk to them. Because they know they do it for coup d'etat. 
and then they start to go and see some Gambians trying to appoint them as ministers and so on. So it took them until Monday to announce the government because they were still jittery. Because there was enormous pressure on Senegal. Senegal really came to intervene because there was a lot of international pressure on Senegal. They even sent their troops to the border. And most of those officers who were at the state house had civilian dresses under their military dress because they were afraid. But you're not saying Nigeria is, is guilty for... It's not, it's not the Nigerian government. Remember, by that time, Nigeria was on the military role. It was Baba Gide's time and then Abacha came, was in power. So these soldiers were not soldiers working on a democratic dispensation. So I would not accuse the Nigerian state per se. But it's the Nigerian soldiers, which obviously is the fault of our president, you know, there was a British Army training team. You, you, you know, you leave a British Army training team and you bring a Nigerian Army training team. These are the masters of coup d'etat. Yeah, I think yeah, that was a big tactical blunder. I, I, I can look at it from a Pan-African perspective, probably. Yeah, but I mean, you, you said that also, but then you have to remember the Nigerian Army, the Nigerian military were actually trained in Sandhurst and in other places. So they were in, in effect trained by this same British that you're talking about. Yeah, some of them. Some of them, no, so no, but Nigeria, no, 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 Nigeria has an NDA. Nigeria has a national yes, defense. Yes, they they, they, they sent few people. That was in the beginning, in the sixties, like right, Gaon, 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 Ojuku, and so on. But yes, but but, uh, but same thing happened in Ghana. Ghana, Ghana had a military government. Mm -hmm. Um, in Liberia had a military government. Mm -hmm. Um, most African countries, even Burkina Faso, had Thomas Sankara and so they all military. No, 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 Sankara went to do his training in Madagascar. No, no, no. no. What I'm saying, they were military. Yeah. But what I'm saying is, like, they were all trained somewhere. So of course, yeah. you can totally blame Nigeria. I mean. There was no, 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 but we, remember the time you're talking about. We're talking about 1994. Right. By 1994, Gambia had 30 years of democracy, uninterrupted rule. If I was a Gambia... Yeah, they president. So he was more or less like a dictatorship anyway. Well, I, I think... I would, no, he was not a dictator. I would say that he's over, overstayed his welcome. He, you know, he, he never won the next election too. He, but he was transparent. There was nowhere there was free and fair election. Even the opposition accepted that. So it's not like he was a dictator. I wouldn't accept that. I don't. I have lot of bones to pick with him. But but, but he, 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 overstayed. he overstayed his welcome. Okay. I think that was the case. But if I was in his position, and being a Democrat in a democratic state, I would look for military training from a country that is run by democracy. Because the thing is, I'm telling you this because the Nigerian officers who were there, it's not their fault. They're not used to that. Because when they came to Gambia, under Gambia was a democracy. The permanent secretary minister of defense is more powerful because he's the one who's controlling the votes, just like in the United Kingdom. But the Nigerian officers they didn't understand that. When they want to order something, it takes time. It has to go through tendering process, um, etc., before it is approved by the Minister of Finance. They used to look at this as an insult. And they used to tell these, the younger Gambian officers that, Oh, this only happens here. In Nigeria, it doesn't happen that. So, so, so you can see what was happening because they are not used to operating under a civilian head. Right. And when they came in, they removed all the senior government officers and they created a new headquarters in Banjul and put them. And now the Nigerian army so officers were commanding the battalions. The Gambia only had, at that time, we only had two battalions, the one in Yundum and the one in Farafene, and some companies. But they were commanded by Nigerian lieutenant colonels. This is why the, the lieutenants are able to overthrow the government, not the captains, not the majors, because the majors and the lieutenant colonels, they were all at the army headquarters, they made staff officers. Okay. So that was why the lieutenants and the captains, who are the ones commanding troops, are able to overthrow the government. All right, let's fast forward a yeah. little bit then. Yeah. Okay, so now there was a standoff with you. Yeah. And um, so a few hours later, you know that they've actually taken, they've seized. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. As I told you, I engaged them in a place called Radio Seat, Bond Road, open fire. They ran towards the cemeteries, but they never returned fire. For what reason, I don't know. So I had to tactically withdraw because my people were, and I don't blame them, they were policemen. They are not, I, I had military training, they didn't have military training, so, and they had overwhelming uh, weapons, although I knew that most of the weapons they had, they couldn't even know how to operate it. So, so maybe I knew something that the other soldiers, but anyway, I kind of tactically retreat and went back to the police headquarters, and there it was really sad, 
that every two seconds I got a phone call from the police divisional commanders telling me the army is attacking their station, is taking over their stations. Until I had a call at the state house where the guards telling me, sir, it's all finished, they, they've taken over. And I remember I had a, a corporal who was my former driver who came and told me, look, sir, you have to leave because uh, you have to leave because this thing is gone. The president has gone on the ship. I never knew that. And I say, what ship? Anyway, and I stayed in the headquarters until the army came and Captain Sonko came and met me there. And he came with the troops and said, oh, you overthrow government, blah, blah. So I told him, no, no, no. You don't tell me this in the, in the street. Come to my office and let's talk and see. But so when he came, I took him to my office. But this time I didn't know that the lieutenants were, second lieutenants were in charge because I was talk, talking to the captain. So the captain was in my office with all my senior police officers. And then suddenly two second lieutenants bashing. I knew one of them, Hydra, because I trained him. He's from the Zanamari. But Samuel, I never saw him. I don't know him. And they just came and said, no meeting, no meeting. So and I just turned around to the captain. I said, Captain, what is this nonsense? Why are the second lieutenant behaving like this? You know, better put them into order. And the captain said, oh, this morning they put a gun on my chest, blah, blah. And I said, oh, my God, this is now, I don't know who is in charge. I was at the headquarters. And then, as I said, I thought the captain was in charge. I just realized now the lieutenant was in charge and they disappeared in the heat of retention because I had a bit of an argument with them. They disappeared. And then I sat down and spoke to the officers and told them that, look, it seems that everything is spoiled and now it's time for individual conscious, conscious decision. So I told them that me, I was never going to be part of any coup d'etat or anything, but it's up to them individually with their conscience. And, uh, did, you, did you at that time know who was um, the leader of the... This time still we know which lieutenants were in charge, but there was no leader yet, I told you. It was after that they would go to the state house and they decided among them because Jame was senior, they were all second left in, and Jame was senior, and they de among decided to make him chairman of the council. Because he was the oldest? Yes. That was it? That was it. But there was yeah. no other criteria? No, no other criteria. And um, obviously, even the guy who was number two, the vice chairman, was more powerful. That's the one he would e end up in the next six months, he would arrest him and jail him. Because that guy came from the army, because Jame was not from the army. Jame is from my branch of the armed forces, from the Zandamari, and he transferred to the army. So this is how they will fall out, um, you know. And then afterwards, as I told you, I, did, I said I was not going to join. And then afterwards, I was arrested and taken to the prison directly. Okay. So you, you when the after three days later, when everybody in the country knew what was going on, yeah, and they've decided that okay, now they say cool, and we've taken over. Yeah. And the head of the AFRC, yes, was uh, Jami. Yes. Okay. Where were you then? Well, at, at the Friday, after the after I told the officers that, look, me, I'm not going to be part of any coup d'etat or anything. And it was Friday anyway, because in the police, Friday is weekend. So I, I went to stay at my cousin, my friend, who is in the, in the capital, Bangal there. I went and stayed there. Because by this time, this army have cut off all the phones. So I have no means of communicating with my dad. But you already accepted that it was over. Yeah, but I know I don't want anything. So, but I wanted to have a word with my father on my next step. And actually, at that time, I had a French visa, and there was a French ship at the port. If I really wanted, because one of my corporals came to see me in the place and told me, "If you want, I'll put you in a car." They were not actively searching for me, because I think by that time they're trying to figure out what they're going to do anyway. So, and all the officers who have become on courts and join they've all gone to the state house to congratulate them and they had their, me i didn't go i stayed where i was staying until the telephones came back to life on saturday or i don't know sunday i spoke to my dad right, before I, before we carry on mm -hmm. let's just go back to that day again because mm -hmm. i was wanting that i read online which is what i was talking to you about about this incident that the president uh, claimed that um um, you were at the arch, and yeah, then I was driving arch. recklessly, and yeah, then you ran out recklessly and tried to run away or something you were like. Being quite cowardly. Yeah. Yes. But it. Um, mm, yeah. I mean, I've reported that online. I mean, that's a that's a blue lie because, as I told you, I was at the bridge. I stopped them there for a couple of hours, and then when I because of the circumstances, when they captured our communication system, I went back to the office to find out what is happening, and then I came back where he was talking which is the arch 
that's 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 near Gambe High School where we all went to the high school. The art was not there then. I went, drove and went to Radio Seed, which is a mile ahead or one and a half mile for those of you who know Gambia. I went to Radio Seed, Bone Road, where the, where the Muslim cemetery is, and set up an ambush and, and fired on them. And then I crossed Bone Road and went by the other road back to the police headquarters. So if I was running away, you know, they would not find me in the headquarters. I would have done like the others who ran away and joined the ship or get a boat and ran away. So he's, he's a blue lie. I think so. What, what do you think? Um, there's been a few mention, especially of you, mm -hmm. by the president over the past few years, and um, every now and again he makes reference to you and tries to um, denigrate you in the press and mm -hmm. say other things. Why do you think he has a fixation with you? Well, because it's simple. I mean, of all the officers that were detained, I am the only officer who refused to take any position or anything. Even my 15 years of service, of you know, I've not been paid a single dime. Not that I want it. And I think that's why he's bitter, because normally what has happened is most of the officers, if they, you release it, even though you've done nothing wrong, but in order just to humiliate you, you know, you will have to write a letter to say thank you for, I don't know, thank you for what, for releasing me, and in the first place you detained me illegally. And then he will kind of cop you in, pay you your pension, or cop you in, and depending on the women caprices, you know, and I categorically refused because even when I was coming out of jail, when they freed me, when the army came with their vehicles, I told them I'm not going to be in your vehicle. I don't want to be. I took a taxi from the gate of the jail and 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 and, and went home, and then I went to exile voluntarily. So I think that is what is paining him. And I never turned my back to beg or or look for position or anything. Yeah. But there was this, um, um, something I read by Sam Sudin, sir, mm. that said um, while you were in detention mm. uh, that um, they'd spoken to the president then mm. and they wanted, um, they were trying to find a position for you mm. within the government mm. and they spoke to the president who was um, reluctant to actually bring you on board. Mm -hmm. But then he acquiesced and he agreed with them. But then in the last minute, mm -hmm. when he, when you were supposed to go and meet the president, mm -hmm. the president changed his mind mm -hmm. and said they want to see you. And according to Samsudin, sir, mm -hmm. this is why you're bitter because then they, because they cut you off at the last minute. Mm -hmm. You know when you were supposed to actually go there and get your own piece of the Gambian bread. <laughs> um, first of all, I'm very reluctant to talk about an individual because you raise. The, his issue. Well, it's online. I know, yeah, it's online. I mean, you raise it, but if you look, I've never responded. What is clear is, I mean, he was close to me, and I don't doubt the fact that maybe he wanted to get me back into the system. He might have done it out of his own volition. Are you saying this never happened? Well, I don't know, because I, I never had opportunity to talk with Jame. When I was released from prison... Yeah, but, but was, was there a, a circumstance or a situation where there was an arrangement that was in place that you would have to speak with Jamie. No, no, not to my knowledge. I mean, I mean, I, I, not to my knowledge. I've never ever attempted to speak to Jamie. I mean, maybe Samsudin Sar was close, was my close to me then, and there was another officer called Bajinka who was close to me. Maybe out of their own volition, they wanted to to get me back into the system, and they started to engage Jame for it. But I was not aware, because remember, uh, when I was detained, they came up with some trump of charges that I stole a wheelbarrow and a rake, something costing four thousand dollars, which is about eighty pound or whatever, fifty pound or British money, and they were taking me to court with the Inspector General of Police and they accused the Inspector General of some other things which we are all trumped up charges but we fought it fought it fought it even there was no rule of law there is no way the magistrate could have uh, convicted us on a charge that is open when the magistrate dismissed the case they dismissed that magistrate so what you have to realize that as soon as they release us the former inspector general of police who went on the board and came back and he was detained with me uh, somehow went and saw Jame, went to pray at his mosque and whatever they did, and Jame appointed him as a commissioner. But our case was still hanging in the courts. So I went to the court to report, because I said that before I leave the Gambia, I must defend, clear my name. I went to the court with my dad, and then the courthouse said, the government has no case against you, the filing in law, what we call nolle prosecai, that means no prosecution. So I told them, okay, then thank you very much, give my father his documents, and that's what 
when they did that on a Monday, that's on the Thursday that I left and went to Senegal to come to the United Kingdom. So, I mean, if at all I wanted a position from Jame or anything, Jame would by now, with, with all what he's saying, he would have done all that thing. He would have come and said, look at this is a document. I never wrote a letter. I never did nothing. I know most of the people who were released and got position had to write a letter and Jame give them an audience. So your intention was, as soon as you were released, you just wanted to leave the country? Well, I left the country because I decided, I mean, if I hadn't joined, I decided from the day of the coup that I don't want to be part of this. And also, I was not very old. I was in my late 20s, early 30s. So I just said, you know, I can rebuild my life. So, and I was keen to go and study on the civilian side. I've studied well in the military side, but I wanted to go and just study on the civilian side, have my normal degree and, and change and move on with my life. Do you think maybe if you were... If you had taken the, the presidential coin then, mm -hmm. you could have maybe affected and be in a position to make changes within the Gambian society rather than being on the outside trying to fight. You would be on the inside trying to change Well, things. there are a lot of people who tried it and it never worked. You've got to understand this is a dictatorship. It's not like in a democracy where you have a right to express your opinion. and uh, It's not that. This is a one-man show. Everybody is walking there, you, you don't have any latitude of initiative. And it's somebody who is very, uh, somebody who is not, um, who is not at ease with himself. Jame is somebody who is very irrational. And remember, we are Africans. I don't believe in this juju business. But it's a reality of fucking Africa. And Jame is a type of person who believes so much in this juju. He doesn't trust it right from left. So even if you work with him, you had good intents on anything, there's nothing stopping him tomorrow just to dream or wake up something and then just accuse you of something. And like all the people who went back there in good faith, some of those officers who, who went back after they were detained, I have nothing against them. But most of them, when they went back, they never lasted. After two, three years, they've fallen apart and then all of them ended up coming to exile like us. So, uh, but also, uh, I must clarify that I knew Jame more than most of these officers. And I know, because I know him from high school and when he came to the army. Yeah, well that was, was going to be my next question to you. So, uh, what was your relationship with him like before cool. the yeah before the twenty second of um, yeah. up, up, up up until the twenty second? Yeah, there, there, there is a lot of meat. But people thought that I had problems with him before. I had never had no problem with him. I senior at him in school. I senior at him in the military. Actually, when he was a recruit, I was involved in his training. I mean, these, I put a picture there in my book about when he was a recruit. And we were training them. And funnily enough, from 1990 up to the day of the coup, he's leaving next to me. Because opposite my quarters is the military headquarters of the military police. That was where he lived. That was the headquarters of the military police. And he had a room there. And then I, my, 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 my compound was the next compound there. And he used to come to my house. I mean, if my wife was here, he would confirm. He comes and eat in my house. I was married. I used to give him money. And we share all the things, lo lo loads of stuff. So there was nothing wrong. Even when the coup d'etat happened, my wife said, oh, there's no coup. If there was a coup, yeah, Jame will tell me. Until my father told him, you don't know this military business. So there was nothing um, in between with me except normal you know, a, a junior and a senior person, but who are colleagues, that type of relation. Which but is a, which wrong with him? Yeah, which is a very Gambian thing. He used to come and eat in my house, because my house is next door. He doesn't have a wife. I had a wife. And he comes there, he speaks with the guards. Sometimes he wants money, he sends the guards and tell them, you know, tell, you know, tell Chong, Chong and I want something, and I give him money. So, until then this thing happened, and... And you know the rest is history. Yeah, this is one of the things. I mean, as um, an outsider, mm -hmm. you know, reading up on this, I find quite intriguing about uh, Jame himself. Mm -hmm. Because on the one hand, you know, you can see him as this um, tyrant, um, you know, that imprisons people, that um, you know, that rights roughshod over the rule of law, and you know, take all these things away. And then on the other hand, it's, <coughs> it seems to be quite an African, a pan-Africanist and uh, uh, someone that fights for the right of women you know for instance like his vice president is a woman uh -huh. he's actually uh, done educational stuff for women in, in the gambia you know like a free education and making sure that women uh, are empowered uh -huh. or so it seems to the outside world uh -huh. so now you've got this and, and then even 
compared to Nigeria, mm. in, in your own case, for mm. instance, mm. and I don't mean that to sound in a bad way, mm. but if you were Nigerian, you, I wouldn't be doing this interview with you now because they would already have killed you, you know, yeah. whoever took over the government, you know, because they don't let people go on exile in, you know, in most African countries. No, 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 but, ruthless no, no, no but, but, but it's a bit different. You have to look at my level in Gambia. No, no, even, no, even, 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 even your president, even, Yawara, mm -hmm. was allowed to actually come back in the country and, you know, it, because it, it, I know now, since October, he's been, it's quite murderous, it, it kills a lot of people, mm. but it seems there's a lot of ex-officials of the government that are actually he allowed, to escape. yeah, he allowed, no, he more than likely allowed to leave the country rather than actually kill people like that. No, so, no, no, well, you've got to understand, when he newly took over power, these were lieutenants. Mm. They were barely in charge of uh, platoon, and now they're in charge of the country. Remember, the first few years, Gambia was more in, interested in consolidating in power because Gambia is very vulnerable. We had, in the early days of the coup, the British gave a, uh, a travel advice, and that nearly rocked the economy until some other people that he employed intervened and in to say that you know this will destroy the country so at the beginning Gambia was very conscious about as I tell you Gambia is not like Nigeria where you have oil and so on like Abacha can sit down and to help with the rest of the world because he has huge oil reserve people talk to him Gambia doesn't have that Gambia's budget is in balance it used to be the U UK before until now it's done by the EU so there's a lot of leverage at the beginning at the beginning they had some killings in November 11 where they killed some mutiny soldiers um, and then you remember you don't just become a tyrant overnight you start to do one killing two killing you get away with it and then it becomes a normal thing so that was what, uh, what has happened and also Gambia is very difficult to entrap people because we have 350 mile border north and south and east of the country anywhere you are in Gambia you are less than 15 miles from Senegalese border so any anybody can escape so 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 at the beginning he was he didn't know what was going to happen and he never knew that these people would become his nemesis in the future okay. because oh, he also at that time needed everybody and that was why he was begging people to join so that so that he can consolidate it's when he, now nobody escapes you see most of the senior officials like uh, Lang Tombong this is our genius but they ended up becoming he was the chief of the army staff of Mumbai and all the orders they're all in jail he sent them to death because now he's consolidated he knows what is happening so he doesn't let people go out and no 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 you don't yeah. escape anymore unless you know you're lucky to run away but uh, during our time these were the early days of the coup you know he hasn't consolidated and hasn't understand right so you think it's got worse with time of uh, course right now the other thing with him is like I was saying before as well that you know a your vice president is woman Yes. Well, the vice president used to work for the Women's Bureau a long time, and the, her husband died, peace be upon him. Her husband was one of the leading architects of the former government, of the President Jawara's party. Well, Jame is very good at having figurehead, because the vice president is not powerful for nothing. Jame has all the leverage, but he needs a fig figure, figure, uh, you know, a figurehead who is there, because Jame may spend most of his time in his village that he's turned now into a city where he has everything. So, the, you know, the, and also because he uh, he's not friendly to most of these president in the West Sub region, so it's convenient for the lady to go and represent her in some of these AU. If you look at it, most of this is the lady going there. But the lady has to... It was a strategic... Of course, yeah, yeah. But the lady doesn't rule any power. So she doesn't really do anything in the... Without well. Jamais consultation, no. Right. Mm. So, and, and that's the other thing, because I noticed that, um, you know, recently, his titles grow more and more all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems like it's actually basically turning the country into its own personal fiefdom. It's like, you know, it's actually his kingdom now, rather than Of course. Else. I did mention it in the earlier parts of the interview that Jamais has like Frank Louis Catos, the state is mine. That's what is happening now. I mean, mm. I mean he cornered all the business, everything. He's, he owns everything. And, mm. you know, he, it's just for all intents and purposes. There was even a time they were sending people. There was a campaign where people were saying that he should be crowned king. You know, if you recite on the internet, you will see it. And, uh, you know, so it just, just tells you. That would have been interesting. Exactly. It's just that he was wanted to become a Bukasa type person. But the problem is, Gambia is very vulnerable in the sense that Gambia doesn't have the resources and etc. 
he needs foreign help and i think that is what is limiting him that is why he's even allowing to have elections even though they are flawed but left to him alone there would be no election he will just be in you know he just be there forever but so the other thing that you said um also so now you're you were detained yeah and then they dropped up they had some dropped up charges dropped yeah. up charges mm. against you mm. and then you ended up spending two and a half years yeah in in the detention yeah but the, it was not the charges it was they said that i was a security detainee they passed a law with the corporate from nigeria and ghana they passed a law i can't even remember decree number three or whatever which said that anybody who's a threat of national security could be detained for six months and renewable Right, so there wasn't any charge, really? Well, no, there was not really any charge, because that was a magistrate case. It was a case of, by English standard, 30, 40 pounds. Yeah. But, but while, while you were detained, there was quite a lot of um, other high-ranking um, Gambian officials. That yeah, yeah, yeah. You. Yes, there were a lot of Yeah, and they, a few of them are now in exile, and a few of them actually went back and worked with the government. Yeah, almost yeah. all of them, yeah. Almost all of them. Yeah. Now, how do you feel about that? I mean, do you feel a sense of betrayal to the people that these people did that? No, no, no. I think it revolves back on to what I said at the time of the coup d'etat when I addressed the police officers at the police headquarters when everything was collapsed, where I said that it's an individual choice. I do recognize sometimes the pragmatists who said that in this sort of situation it's better to try to work in the system and do some bit of changes. Right, then that brings me up to your, the three Fs. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> fight it, flow it, or flow it. You don't know recite the on the internet. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it's uh, it's 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 really uh, an individual choice. But for me, I had long decided on the day of the coup that I would have nothing to do with this government because I know Jame and I know the way he thinks, and I knew that you know if you start it, it's not going to end well. So my best bet was to go and um, re-educate myself, get another profession and carry on with my life. And I'm glad I did it, you know, this, I have no regrets. Okay, so um, there were four young officers that mm. took power. power yeah, campaign. yeah. Right, so now there's only one of them? Yeah, it's only Jame. And the other three are... One is dead, one died in prison, because he, the one who was vice president next to him, and the one who was minister of interior was the number three, he, they, they did nothing, so basically. Uh, he, no, no, he arrested them. He cooked up a story and just arrested them after six months. And they met us in jail. And those were the two people who put me in jail. And <laughs> they came and met me now in jail. And they were there, and sadly, one of them died, was called Hydera. And Sabali, who was there, they made some trumped-up charges, locked him up for nine years. But he was lucky to come out after nine years. And now he's outside in exile somewhere. And then there was the other guy, he did the conspiracy to eliminate the two, who was called Singapore. He made him a civilian minister and towards the end dismissed him and he's there. I don't know what he's doing. So, but now you've been, okay, 94, then 96, 97. Yeah, you I came out 97. You, and then you went to Senegal and then from he, Senegal yeah. you came to, yeah. to, to the United Kingdom. You've been here ever since. Yeah, so so since I mean, 97. You, you, it, it must be kind of um, a bittersweet. Mm. A feeling for you that you know, okay, you're out, you're free, you have freedom, you can express your views, you can say what you like about the president, mm -hmm. you can say what you like about Gambia, mm -hmm. you know, um, but you can't go there, yeah. And, um, you know, while you can travel around every other country in the world, mm -hmm. you're the one country that I'm sure you really want to go to, mm -hmm. you can't go to. How does that make you feel? Well, it's mixed feeling. I mean, everybody, you're proud where you are born, but. That's the reality. I mean, as I said, my mother died in 2000. Do you think you paid a, 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 a huge price? I've already paid a huge price. My mother died in 2000. I cannot go. My father is very old. He's about 91. Nobody knows. We pray for him to have long life. But at some point, I, you know, if there's no changes, I cannot go. I've already paid a, a very heavy price, which is irreversible. So there's no need for regrets and so on. And... Uh, it's not only me. Look at Tambombeki. Look at uh, Tambombeki. Yeah, in South Africa, they were all in exile here. Which president? It was. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, but there are some other people who went. Who, they didn't get. They were not like Maria Makeba, who was the very famous South African yes, musician. Yeah, she was in Guinea, and 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 she went back. So there are a lot of people who were in exile, and one day we'll go back home. Okay, I get you. So basically, mm. what you're saying is, now, even though you're exiled today, it doesn't mm. mean that it's exile forever. It's forever. 
friends like okay exactly okay. yeah right but then there are there were quite a few africans actually no, who died also <laughs> in the process so it's <laughs> it's a reality yeah yeah mm. yeah but the thing is you know is that is that, is that a dream for you though to come back home yeah, I want to go home. I want to go and see my mother's grave, and you know, uh, and, and, and I've got some other relatives. And you're, you're but, still but, quite but young. I, I'm still quite young. But also, the thing is, I was prepared when I was leaving the Gambia. You know, going to exile is not an easy option. Before I left the Gambia, I knew uh, I was prepared. Have you been to the UK before then? Yeah, yeah, I've been here a couple of times. I studied in France, so, so uh, you were quite. Oh, you were used to. Yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm used to Europe, but I was quite ready to say that there might be a possibility I might never come back and once you start from that premise then you you, you don't bother but you see when you come newly it's difficult because you still have run away and then Gambia is still on you but as the years go by you become more to your adopted country because that's, that's where you settle I travel a lot because of work and uh, I'm always happy when I'm back to the UK soil because it's as real as I'm back home because oh, this is where I have my family, my wife, my kids and you know. But, but then in the recent um, two, three, four years now, mm. there's been a huge mobilization or galvanization of the uh, Gambian or Senegambian society or diaspora mm. that actually seems to be actually seriously this time around pushing forward. Forward, yeah, for change. Something. That must give you some pain, so some kind of, um, you Hope. know. Yeah, yeah. You know, I just hope, but but then you know, it must reawaken some kind of feelings in you because now mm -hmm. it seems like you guys are on the cusp of maybe taking your country back. Or yeah, something. yeah, yeah. Because as I said uh, before, uh, I've been agitating since I came to the UK in '97. I mean, in '98, '99, we used to go when there's a social gathering. We have lots of Gambia and we used to go bring our leaflets to explain to the people what is happening in Gambia is not good. You know, we have to unite, we have to do this. And that time many people bothered or they didn't care. But now everybody is, is worried. Everybody is caring. We're coming together because obviously what Jamme has done has touched every family. You know, even before I came when I was with you, I was with somebody, you know, a prominent Gambian who just ran away. You know, I don't want to mention his name, you know, until he decides to come out and speak. And, 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 and now this thing has virtually touched every Gambian family. So that is why now it is like you've, you've captured the world. There's like a reawakening by the, by the diaspora and everybody is coming forward. And hopefully this will be a last final push to get rid of Jamie so that we can get a Gambia which is democratic, which is at ease with itself. And, and, and left to the people to decide what form of uh, you know, governance they want. And, and then another thing that you said was that you, you're not interested in any political office or anything like that. Yeah. Um, if say like for instance, you know, like um, I remember the, an interview I did earlier, and I was saying like, well, Nigeria was kind of in the same situation. I know during a batch time. When you, when time. you have some of some exiles yeah, here, right, it right, was right. like the the, the poet Lauren, What was his name? Um, Ken Sarawua. No Sarawua. Oh, uh, Wadishenka. So yeah, Wadishenka. Yeah. All of these people were out. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. But but the thing the thing with Abacha, which is very similar to what's yeah, happening down there, yeah, exactly. Right it's like a small Abacha. The country became powerless to, we didn't know what to do. Yeah, that was a big thing. But the Nigerian intellectuals mobilized outside. No, well, but that wasn't what got him out. But there was a natural that was a natural cause. Well, we don't know whether he was a natural cause or, or, or whether he or whether he was even murdered. There is, there is this theory that he was murdered. Well he was poisoned. Well, I mean you have to look at it this way. The guy was I think he was like fifty something years old. Yeah. And he was in tip top health more or less. Yeah. Natural causes it doesn't really happen like that. Right on that, exactly. So, so I mean, whatever the case may be, but, but the point I'm trying to make is like, in Abacha's case, right, mm -hmm. Nigerians, mm -hmm. we were desperate mm -hmm. as Nigerians. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we didn't know how to get rid of him yeah. because he was just all powerful. Yeah. It got to that position where you can't even talk to your... Uh, I know, I know, yeah. You, they could be in the same exactly. service. What, what, we ha what was happening right in Gambia? So, yeah. so mm. the only thing was like, we call it divine intervention. Yeah, miracle. You know, we're a miracle that mm. actually he just died in his sleep or he just died suddenly. Whatever, yeah. We, that we couldn't deal with. Mm. So that's how the country was able to change. Mm. All right, now. But there are two different issues here. Mm -hmm. Abacha was ruling over 150 million mm -hmm. with huge reserves of fuel. Yeah. A very strong army. Yes. So obviously, the only possibility was divine intervention.
Right. But in Gambia, this guy doesn't have sits on huge resources. Okay. He has an economy which is very vulnerable to external factors. So the circumstances are, are, are completely different. But he seems so, like a very powerful man in the country. Because someone told me, mm -hmm. you know, that um, the reason he's able to actually do what he's doing is because Gambians are predominantly peace-loving people. Are, yeah. Are people. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, because they're not used to violence. Yeah. So it's very difficult to all of a sudden switch, be, uh, you know, like... Uh, starts becoming very violent and protesting and doing all that. No, and but he knows that. Yeah, but Gambian, we never had like Gambian just for activist people agitating and so on. Right. This is new. Okay. And and he is unfortunate. He came to power, and even Rollins told him when he came to power, and Rollins came there, when he was, uh, the wall is no more uh, like a. Uh, bipolar wall. So you know that was almost twenty years ago. Yeah, that was it's almost. Still there. Yeah, yes. But the thing is, we have the gift of the internet, where we are penetrating, we are enlightening our people. The diaspora is the united, and also why is that? We can also have divine intervention, but that's just a side issue, you know, like a bonus. But 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 you know, the, the government forces are marching, and there is no way he going to he can stop us because. Um, now every Gambian is pissed off with him. People are fed up. It's just that they're yearning for a leader, and that leader can come before or can come even post, because there can't be now any kind of demonstration and anything, and a leader can come out from there. So, so. But, but don't you think? I mean, that's that's the other thing because I, I was speaking to again when I was speaking to some other Gambians, mm. or another Gambian about. Why you know like you know like the your British government and the the, the um, State Department in America mm -hmm. you know are not more involved in helping you know the situation and he said what used to happen in the past before the CDC was formed mm -hmm. was that um you know the, you go to the British government and they say yeah but we spoke to another group yesterday we spoke to another group yesterday yeah there different, so many different, different groups. groups yeah that's what I was saying. it was more right. coordinated was yeah. coordination. so yeah. now that you have the coordination, coordination. yeah we're, we're speaking with one voice yeah one voice mm -hmm. then shouldn't you have mm -hmm. like um a focal point as a person that even Gambians back home and Gambians in the diaspora can say well okay but well, this is the alternative we have to 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 to, uh, to the to the current president, mm. you know, so no, we you don't have something like that. No, you know. no, we already have something similar in the sense that, as far as the United Kingdom is concerned, we have formed our group and we have designated somebody as the chairman. The person was the former vice president, and some other people who are part of the executive. Mm. Right now, it's not an issue of who is the leader of Gambia tomorrow. Right now, what we have one is leadership within the diaspora for us to get rid of him. When we get rid of him, th there are many forms. They can, we can have a, uh, a transitional government where you can have a, a transitional team to run it until they can have an election. But as uh, the only as the one that is mm. um, less tainted or the on on solid out of everybody there, shouldn't you be ready to? pick up that mantle and lead your people in that respect? No, because uh, to be honest, I am not a natural politician. <laughs> I am a soldier. Um, all my life I, I, I work. Uh, I, I am not very good at business. I'm neither good at politics uh, because I like predictability. Uh, I, uh, and I have certain principles and values. I mean, so that's why I'm really not interested in leadership position, but I'm a Gambian and I, I, I am very much active here and it's only a fool who will say never, never. I mean, you never know what, what the future lies. I mean, some, you can have tomorrow another government and they, they require my services to go and work for my country. In, you can work for your country in many forms and shape. You don't have to be minister or prime minister or president. You can you can work even in the private sector, in the charitable sector to do something, to, in civil society to enlighten. So there is, there is a lot of things one can do. But at the present moment, you know, I am, uh, what I'm more interested is we get Jame, we, we get a transition, rebuild our institution and, and organize free and fair and transparent election and move on. And then talk about cooperation with Senegal, our immediate neighbor, and then a sub-regional cooperation. All right. Okay. That sounds good. I think we're done. Yeah. Okay. Is there anything else that you want to add that, you know, that I've actually talked about? Well, yeah, I just wanted to talk about what's the issue of this Nigerian mercenary Georges that we have in Gambia. Right, okay. I think that's very important. Last time, about a couple of months back, we had a, we, we did a demonstration and went to the Nigerian embassy here and, and, and gave them a petition about some of these Nigerian 
mercenary judges in Gambia. As I said, we have to distinguish. It is not that this Nigerian government is involved. These are Nigerian hustlers who happen to study law and come to Gambia and the man makes them judges. They are not judges in Nigeria. Makes them high court judge or court of review judge and they're just locking up uh, uh, Gambian citizens uh, on no basis of law. Uh, how many of them do you know? We know some Justice Paul, if you Google it, you know, and then there, there's another one, he, he, he came from America, he was a security guard in America and now he's, he's Justice War War or something like that. Most the Nigerian as well. Yeah, they're all Nigerians. Yeah. So, uh, does so, the constitution allow for that? I mean, uh, you know, that's one arm of the... Uh, well, yeah, you when know. you talk about a constitution where it is respected by government, like we have a dictatorship, we don't respect anything. But what we want to do is we want to know, uh, you know, we never know whether Nigerians will listen to this uh, program, obviously, that the Nigerian Bar Association, we are appealing to them to find out about these people because they were trained in Nigeria so that the bar... There was even somebody who was this, this debarred in Nigeria and then he was in Gambia and the man made him a judge. I forgot the name. It just escaped me. But I doubt the Nigerian Bar Association would have um, be interested over them because they're not practicing in Nigeria. Yeah, but they will have to go back later. Well, if they go back then they can be dealt with. It's yeah, that's what I'm mean, saying. If you're a doctor that you trained in, you know, India. Mm -hmm. No, but these are Nigerian lawyers close to the Nigerian Bar. That's what, that's what gives them the qualification for the man to appoint them. Well, what right. we are saying is we need to document it as Gambia and we know them but we have to get an interlocutor in Nigeria so that we can send them the names of these people so that they are aware of what is happening and also the Nigerian government to be aware of this that they are tarnishing the name of Nigeria even though the government is not involved but they are tarnishing the name of Nigeria because the average Gambian perception is seeing that it's the Nigerians doing this to us. The Nigerian government has nothing to do with this because these are Nigerian hustlers who came to Gambia and know that there is an idiot guy there, we can make money out of it, we do his bidding, it's not our country, we can do whatever we want and then we get some money because some of them run away. Right. Uh, you so know. so my, my question was now, you, you had um, a rally at the Nigerian embassy. Yeah, so and we said putting the petition there. Right, so what was it? Has there been any outcome? Well, they told us that they will forward it to the appropriate authorities in Nigeria. As you know, this other thing, that's the only diplomatic language they can tell us. What happens later, I don't know. I think you probably need to get some lobbying done. Yeah, somewhere. From somewhere within Nigeria, yeah. 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 We need to directly contact the Nigerian Bar Association to alert them of what is happening give them the names of these people so that if they want to come back and practice in Nigeria, they know what they've done. Okay, so now the very final thing, now is, is there a message that you would like to say to Gambians? Because this, you know, if it's online, Gambians will be watching this as of well. Of course, so yeah, yeah, my message is, uh, as I have been constantly saying... Talk to the camera now if you want. Yeah, my message is, as I have been constantly saying, is that there is a momentum, and let's seize this momentum. We have unity, now the diaspora is working in a coordinated way, and we are linking up with opposition back home. I mean, and we have to shake this fear of like, oh, we have to go on holidays, Gambia. You know, it's just the last drive and we will get Jamie out of our country. We'll get back our country and go back to the smiling coast of Africa that it was, not, not fear rules. Um, that, that, that's basically my message. And the key issue that's going to bring it is unity, unity and coordination. Thank you.